Good morning, everyone. I want to thank the Dr. Gould and the organizers for inviting me here today. I'm actually really excited to be here. Two of my favorite things to do are one, give out grant awards. You always have happy people. <laughs> and then come to see what the results of some of those awards are. And so today I'm, I'm really excited to see what's going on here at NC State. And then we also have some of our current and our TPIs here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they're doing as well. Okay, I've been left in charge. Is this, this is okay. <laughs> all right, we, we're good, we're all good. I scroll, okay. So we're either gonna go forward or we're gonna go backwards, but this will be good, this will be good. So today what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of context from the National Science Foundation of how we're thinking about graduate education. So you're going to kind of get the 10,000 foot view. We're going to start off by talking about the context at the foundation. I also want to talk about what we see as career paths, so a little bit of data on that, and then talk about some of the policy that's been put in place. There's been a recent report that came out looking at graduate education um, nationally and where we see policy going in that sense. Then I'm going to back up and talk about some of the programs within the Division of Graduate Education that are addressing some of these needs that we see nationally. So we'll start off with the foundation and you if you want to know where somebody thinks they're moving and what's important you look at the money. So we put money behind graduate education at the National Science Foundation. This is a priority for us and it's important. Every year, we spend about a billion dollars on graduate education through the foundation. We do this by supporting over 40,000 graduate students. And if you look at the pie chart, you'll see that the bulk of that funding comes out through our content area directorates, giving out research assistantships to graduate students. And then about the other 20% are um, scholarships, fellowships, and through traineeships. One thing I just want to point out is if you look at the pie, the 5%, the traineeships look pretty small. But what you need to keep in mind is those funds are helping build up infrastructure at institutions. So they're not just impacting the individual students that are benefiting in the moment, but they're actually starting to change the culture at institutions. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. So when we think about the National Science Foundation and where we're going, we're always looking to our strategic plans. And I'm so glad nobody's falling asleep when I say strategic plan. It, it really is important for us thinking about where do we go. And when you look at the strategic plans within the foundation, you'll see the first one that's up there is we want to expand knowledge. And we're doing this within content research areas as well as within learning. And later on today, I'll talk a little bit about one of the programs that we support that helps build up that knowledge within the sphere of graduate education. We also want to build up the human capacity that we need in order to meet the grand challenges that we face within the nation. And so this is where we really see graduate education fitting in. This is where we're helping to train the next generation of leaders that will step up and, and lead us in, in meeting these truly interdisciplinary convergent challenges that we're facing nationally. The last goal there is really internal for the foundation to help us work better and think about what do we need to be doing to um, meet the needs of the country. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the, the context for graduate education within the foundation and where we see things sitting. This is a really dynamic time um, to be thinking about science and to be thinking about where graduate education fits in. So if you start thinking through some of the really big talking points that NSF is thinking about in terms of the science landscape, these are the things you're going to see with the white text in, in the boxes there. We think about global competition. The U.S. for a long time has been the leader in a lot of fields, but in order to maintain a competitive edge, we need highly trained individuals to be feeding in to these different STEM disciplines and the STEM areas where we need um, the workforce to help move this. 
what well, one of the things that we see, I think, that really helps to push this envelope are the partnerships that we're finding between industry and the academic sphere. It's helping to move students out into these um, quickly emerging areas and helping to keep that competitive edge. We also are thinking about new enabling technologies. So things are changing quickly in terms of the tools that are available to researchers. And that's important to be thinking about where, where is the next thing coming. So I'm also going to date myself a little bit. So when I started graduate school, my PhD mentor got her PhD by sequencing one gene. Okay, just hold the laughter. I got my PhD for figuring out a few genes that were involved in a regulatory circuit. Now, when you think about high throughput gene sequencing, it's just amazing. You know, we're thinking about personalized medicine, right? You know, it, it's just amazing how quickly things are changing. And so we need to be adapting to that to help our students have those skill sets so that they, they can grow into this over time. We're also thinking about data intensive areas. You think about all the technology that's coming down for monitoring and all of this stuff. What do we do? We just keep generating more data. How do you handle that productively? So those are things that we're really thinking about. Uh, the role of complex systems is going to continue to be an issue. So you think about smart cities, everything um, that we're collecting in terms of sensor data plus the interaction at the interface of that human technology frontier. How do you assess that? How do we know what's going on there and why is that important? And these systems are going to turn out to be, I think, just as complex as many of the natural systems that we see. And so we're kind of looking at that interface. And then finally on here, we've got the convergence research area. And when you're talking about big challenges, things that we're looking at nationally and globally, I'm going to really reiterate what your provost and dean just mentioned. And I'd see it's like preaching to the choir in this room, which is a nice thing. Um, we, we need to come together to solve these problems. We can't remain siloed. And I think keeping students siloed is not in their best interests moving forward. So the other piece, well, I've got too much technology up here, there we go. The other piece that we think about at the foundation when we're thinking about our priorities is overlaid on that strategic plan are our 10 big ideas at the National Science Foundation. And these are the areas that we see moving forward in, in terms of funding in the near future. So we've got the, research ideas up there. There's six of our big research ideas, and I'm just going to briefly go over these. One is harnessing the data revolution. This is talking about all of that big data. What do we do with all of that? And that is really has been an important part of some of our graduate training programs. Right now, about half of our portfolio is, is embedded within these large data pieces. You'll see there's one up there for the human technology frontier. So what happens when we start interfacing um, in, a, in a more integrated way with technology? What does that mean for society and how do we move forward? Navigating the new Arctic. So as things are changing, what does that mean? And how do, how do we measure this and what are we going to do in, in that space? We're looking at um, a new area of astrophysics, so a window on the universe. Quantum is going to be very important, I think, moving forward. We're seeing a lot of initiatives in that area. And then understanding the rules of life. So how can we predict phenotypes? And I think that's going to be big, you know, when we're thinking about genetic engineering. How can we actually predict phenotypes? Now, those are some of the big research ideas, and then kind of overlaid on that, are these process ideas that you see down at the bottom. Mid-scale research is looking at infrastructure um, impacts within institutions, not super huge, not small, middle of the road. Um, NSF 2050 is really a way for us to support things that don't fall into a box. Again, these ideas of convergence and, and grand challenges, things that are happening, don't always silo within the National Science Foundation, nor do they silo within institutional structures. So how can we support those better? 
the INCLUDES initiative is an ongoing initiative at the foundation that, again, is overarching, trying to bring um, more inclusive approaches and more diversity into our student bodies and into our researchers. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about convergence here. We, when we started doing a lot of our training grants, like the IGERTs, we were talking about interdisciplinary research, and we still are very invested in interdisciplinary research. But what we're seeing is kind of moving along this continuum from interdisciplinary research to more transdisciplinary research to truly convergent research where we might have new and emerging fields. And so what, we, what we're always doing is challenging people to really think about what are these grand challenges and how do you move along that continuum. And, and I think the closer we move along the continuum to transdisciplinary and convergent spaces, we're going to be training our students in, in a more comprehensive way. Okay. So, so one of the projects that I'd like to share with you today that that sort of embody some of these things, you know, thinking about cutting edge and, and what do, how does this look and, and how do we train our students in this space is from an IGERT project at Worcester um, Institute of Technology. And we're all going to keep our fingers crossed. And I think we may have to be very, very quiet. We're not sure. Can a spinach leaf be bioengineered into a patch that might one day repair a damaged heart? We were having lunch one day, there was a piece of spinach there, and we noticed kind of that veiny, vascular pattern of the spinach, and it reminded us of that kind of vascular system that we would see in a heart. For Josh Gerschlack, a graduate student, turning spinach into heart tissue was more than just an inspired idea. It was a chance to exercise his innovator's mindset. I think the big thing with that innovator's mindset is making connections, and it's really trying to look at you know how we do this research and how we perform the research and try to look at it a little bit outside the box. With support from the National Science Foundation, biomedical engineer Glenn Gaudette and his colleagues at Worcester Polytechnic Institute are training a new generation of PhD students like Josh to be not just scientists but entrepreneurs as well. We wanted to add into our technical engineering courses more information on business, for example, but more information also on how to be creative. What I do is develop better ways to deliver stem cells to a failing heart. Our lab is focused on developing better ways to get those cells into the heart and get them to stay retained in, in the heart tissue. Katrina Hansen is part of the first group of PhD students to complete the program and is headed for a career in private industry. She says her experience here has set her up for success. And they actually focus on teaching entrepreneurship to scientists and engineers, so not necessarily teaching entrepreneurship to business students, but teaching it to people with our skill set. Gaudette says with his team, the bioengineering comes first, figuring out how to regenerate heart function for patients who have had heart attacks. He also believes changing times call for new skill sets. And so it really is, is different uh, than the conventional training that we used to provide to our students. Because it's allowed us to go out on a ledge a little bit and try something different. And try to get our students to focus more on being innovators. So what's next for the spinach idea? And so what we could do is use that leaf as the kind of scaffolding, as that base material, and then we can grow the tissue up on top of it, and we would have this vascularized tissue that we could then potentially grow to that large clinically relevant size. Training a new generation of scientists to take their ideas from lab to the marketplace. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. Thanks, Miles. So <laughs> that's one of the perks of being at the National Science Foundation. We get Miles O'Brien to talk about IGERT training. Um, but what the reason I wanted to show that was I think it, it really embodies the idea that we, we can't just be doing science in one small area. We need additional skill sets for students so that they can move on. You, you'll notice in there one of the graduate students actually talked about she's moving on to private industry. And that's kind of a segue, oops, if I go the right direction, no, 
into the next thing that I wanted to share with you. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some data on careers. And so where are graduate students actually going when they finish? And it's not, it's not where, where we used to all go. So they're not going to simply go always into tenure track positions. And so if you take a look at this data over time, you'll see that when we started out in 1993, we have about 53% of the individuals that are in non-academic positions at the bottom. And then up at the top, you'll see um, these non-tenured positions, which are not, um, we wouldn't consider those being part of the academic um, pathway. And those two sectors over time are continuing to grow. And at the same time, the tenured and tenure track positions are continuing to shrink. And so I think that reality talks to the fact that we need to be thinking about where are our students going and really support them as they move down those career pathways. It's also important to look at which sectors people are stepping into. And if you look at this, the graph on the left, you'll see that, that we've, we've got doctoral students moving into four-year institutions, and then about half of them are moving into industry and business. The masters, not surprisingly, more of those students are going into business and industry. Now, this is looking at a percentage of the number of students. You know, So out of all the master's students that graduated, this is what we see. But I think it's important to keep in mind that we graduate about 10 times the number of master's students that we do to PhD students. So if we look at this in actual numbers, what you see is that disproportionately, master's students are impacting industry. A lot of those students are going into industry, and even though the PhDs are split, it's a much smaller number of students moving forward. So when we talk about graduate education, we're usually talking about PhD students or PhDs and masters combined. But I think it's, it's really a benefit to the nation to start thinking about master's students a little bit more and what, what are they getting in terms of skill sets as they move out into industry. It's also helpful, I think, to take a look at what people are actually doing when they get to their jobs. And so this is looking across different sectors and looking at the skill sets that people are using once they get into their positions. So you'll see the first two, people reported out, what do I do during my job? That's kind of what this is. We asked them, what do you do? And so if you take a look at the first two, you'll see that the, one of the main job duties for people, whether they're in you know, business and industry, government or education, they're still doing a lot of basic and applied research and development. So the fact that we're training students to do research, that's good. You know, so that, that's aligned with what everybody is doing. But then when you start looking down, you'll see there's other skill sets that people need. Not surprisingly, if you go into education, you're doing a lot of teaching, but you also have a lot of other things in management that you're doing. So there's a lot of um, additional professional skills that are needed as you move into these different areas. All right. so. We've talked about what NSF is thinking. We've looked at where our students actually end up and what they might need. I just want to talk a little bit about the policy that's involved. So over the years, there's always policy statements that come out and studies that are done looking at graduate education. Two, two studies that were pretty important that took place about 20 years apart are shown up here. One is reshaping the graduate um, education for scientists and engineers. That took place in 1995. And then more recently, in, in 2015, we had the report out revisiting um, the STEM workforce. What's kind of interesting about these when you look at them is they took place 20 years apart, but they kind of came to some of the big same conclusions. 
we need to train students to be productive in the STEM workforce. And that means more than just how do you do research. They need additional professional skill sets so that they can go out and be productive. So that was really one of the biggest findings that came out of both of these reports. There was additional um, suggestions on how the foundation might help to fund this, which is through the traineeships, which we've continued to main maintain at the foundation. Today, though, what I'd like to focus on more is looking at a recent report, very recent, it came out last week. And if you haven't had a chance to look at this, I think this group in particular will have an interest in looking at this um, report. It's called Graduate STEM Education for the 21st Century. And what I'd like to do is first give you a rundown of just what's in the report before we move on and look at um, some recommendations that came out. So the first thing in the report, which I think is a very important thing, is they talk about the fact that it's not that our graduate education system is broken. For a long time, the US graduate education system has been the gold standard internationally. It still is. We still have a lot of international students coming here to study. But we have a lot of challenges coming up. We have a lot of changes taking place. And the system has to be willing to adapt and change so that we can maintain that competitive edge. Some of the things that they talked about as, as um, disruptors that we need to adapt to are changing and emerging research technologies. So it's what we were talking about before. Things are changing very, very rapidly. And we need to be, have our students ready to adapt to those changes. We're seeing a shift in the nature of the work. We're seeing changes in career pathways. And we're seeing demographic shifts. And all of these things need to be incorporated into our vision of how graduate education works and what we need to be doing. They also lay out what they call an ideal STEM graduate education system. And I think that's actually a very useful exercise. You can look down it and you can kind of see where you fall out and what you're thinking where you might be able to um, glean some ideas from and think about things that might be better if they were changed in your own system. They also lay out core competencies including professional competencies. And so when you look down their core competencies, I think probably everybody would recognize it as a PhD program. I think that's always one of the concerns with these. It's like if they lay this out, it's like, is this gonna be something where they're saying, these are the competencies we need and it's gonna look somehow foreign and not like what we look normally see. But I think you would recognize it, but what they're really doing is layering on those additional skill sets. And then they've got a set of key recommendations for stakeholders. These are institutions, they're agencies, um, and so they kind of go across that whole spectrum of stakeholders in the graduate education sphere and think about where people can come in and what they can do to help. It's a comprehensive report. There's a lot of pieces in there. And so what I'm going to do today is focus more on what the ideal system is, what they came up with for this ideal STEM graduate education system, and then talk a little bit about how so what we're doing within the foundation is aligning with this. So at the beginning of this, they've got some, some really big overarching things. And these are the three that I have at the top. I kind of see these as much larger than the training piece per se. So one of the things they're calling for is transparency in terms of data for students so that students can make informed decisions. How do you pick a graduate program? <laughs> you know, I mean, you think about that, like how did we all navigate to get where we're at? I don't really know how often that was data driven. And Institutions are collecting data. They're starting to think about how do you share out this data. Um, we actually just funded a workshop at AAU, um, Amer the Association of American Universities, last week to talk about this among institutions of how do you start to generate this data in a standardized way so that it can be shared out and students can see this data. How do you compare, where do students go for their careers when they leave these programs? Um, 
you know, what are what are they doing while they're there? What are the types of support and training they get while they're there so that students can make informed decisions in terms of institutions as well as programs? I will tell you right now, this is not meant to be a competitive process. That's never the point of this. The point is to help students find the best fit for them. Um, they also suggest that we promote diversity and inclusion. We talked about the changing demographics. I mean, some of these programs right now, you know, are doing better than others. When you look at some areas, they're, they're more inclusive. Um, I, I'm not going to call out any particular areas. We all know the ones that, that are less inclusive. And so some have a lot more work to do than others. The other thing that came up that was really overarching was the importance of hearing student voices. So having those conduits to the administration and mentors so students have a voice as graduate programs are changing and evolving. Now in terms of the training, these are the things that you see at the bottom. And I think these are going to resonate with everybody in this room. It's very important to have technical literacy as well as deep specialization. They're suggesting rich learning experiences, so experiential learning, um, getting out in the community, understanding how to work with different stakeholders, allowing for project-based learning within interdisciplinary teams, learning to work within the team and getting um, instruction in how to do that. They also emphasize the professional competencies so that students are, are ready to, to move out into the workforce and allow and support career exploration. And then the last piece on there is strong advising and mentoring. And this, this was not laid out as, as we don't have that now. It was laid out sometimes mentors need additional professional development and training. We see a lot of mentors, not that they don't want their students to go into private industry, they don't know anything about it. They, they find it very difficult to mentor those students. And so it was laid out in the report in that way. So what I'm going to do now is, is move on to taking that ideal and talking a little bit about some of the programs that we have within the Division of Graduate Education that seem to align with some of the things that they're suggesting. The main program that I'm going to talk about is the NSF Research Traineeship Program. This really was the next iteration after IGERT. So it's kind of like IGERT 2.0. So we, were, we took some lessons learned from IGERT and moved on um, to our next iteration, which is the NSF Research Traineeship Program, or the NRT Program. And the key goals of this program really are to have interdisciplinary convergent research themes and training in place, and then also inclusive workforce development. When you think about the way that this lays out in terms of the recommendations from the report, what we envision is normally what we call a pie-shaped training model, or sometimes you'll see these as comb-shaped, so more than two pillars going down. And this particular example would be like for someone in biology, maybe. You'd have your specialty domain. You're probably going to overlay that with um, some computational and statistics. And then you're going to have a breadth of knowledge, and that breadth can also include different professional competencies. And so this is normally the way we envision this, and it aligns very well with what was suggested in the recent report from the National Academies. I just wanted to give you kind of a snapshot of some of those professional competencies that are shared out among um, fellows within our programs within NRT. And the ones on the left in the light blue you see, those are the ones that we see in most of our NRT projects. So everybody does science communication training. And then mentoring is a big um, piece of what happens, career preparation, and research ethics. The next suite in there is looking at a lot of community engagement, leadership, um, collabor collaboration, and team building. Each of these professional development opportunities that are incorporated into the projects are aligned with the goals of what they're doing in that particular project. So you'll see not everything appears everywhere, um, but it really depends on what the goals of that particular project are. Now, because communication is really important in our projects, I wanted to just share one, one um, this, is, this is a product that came out of one of the communication trainings. Um, workshops that they have going on at UC Berkeley. And I'm going to see if we can get this started here. 
And what this is, is a sonification of global data looking at CO2 concentrations and temperature. What you're hearing is that the, the tone represents the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere while the pitch and intensity of the plucked strings is the average temperature. And the, what the students wanted to do, these are three NRT fellows, they wanted to find a way to represent that data to the general public that's not, okay, let's face it, as boring as a graph, you know? So they were looking for something that was a little more interactive. And what I'm gonna do is slide this along. If you just kind of close your eyes, this is all pretty zen, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide us along here. Oops. And, and we're gonna just get up to the 40s. It's, it's a little disturbing, isn't it, when you get to the end? And, and I thought that was an incredibly creative way for these NRT fellows to take that data and share it out with a non-scientific audience. Their, their, some of their quotes were along the lines of, nobody even wants to talk about climate change anymore. It's overwhelming. It's boring. It's this, it's that. And this was sort of their response to that. They worked with a faculty member in the music department to generate that. And so I thought that was a really nice connection across areas um, for them to look at that communication piece. Oops. Now what I'd like to do is just share with you a couple of projects in NRT so you can kind of see what these look like. I think they're going to look in, on the surface very similar to the IGERTs. There are some subtle changes as we went through to do, to do these as compared to the IGERTs. But this is a uh, program at the University of Syracuse led by Dr. Laura Lautz. It's called the Empower Program. And this particular program is looking at research at the, energy, at the nexus of energy and water resources. I always have to read from my list. They have so many people involved in this, but they have faculty from earth sciences, chemistry, civil and environmental engineering, public affairs, and communication involved. And students are taking training in, um, that's integrated with education and policy, science, communication, law, and business. So they're really reaching off across a number of different areas so that students understand that if you're working at this nexus of energy and water, there's going to be policy implications. You're going to work with a community. You need to understand all of these broader pieces. There's a few things I'd like to highlight in this particular project. They, they focus on career pathway experiences. Each student is allowed to select experiences, either an international internship or an industry internship that aligns with their career goals. They're also able to put in for seed grant funding so that they can do team um, project-based um, research that's of their own um, Gen Genesis, so that it's something that they come up with that they want to do, usually high risk, that they don't have funding for otherwise. This particular project has about 50% of its trainees funded and 50% non-funded, which is, which is typical of our projects that we have out there. The other one that I wanted to just briefly mention is a program at the University of Southern Mississippi called Interface. And this particular project is looking at advanced materials design. And these are things that might be used for biomaterials, renewable energy applications. And they have extensive partnerships with the university, industry, and government labs. And so their faculty are from polymer science, engineering, chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And they work as part of interdisciplinary teams with staff scientists from national and industry labs. And all of the mentors have um, multiple, multiple, multiple disciplinary co-advising teams that work with these, with these students. So you'll also see that they get a lot of um, additional professional competency training through boot camps and, um, and other opportunities. The important thing to keep in mind with all of these, it's integrated with their, their research and training. So there's not separate pieces out. Everything is integrated in, and we see that with our NRT projects. The other program that I wanted to mention 
um, this morning is our Innovations in Graduate Education program. This program is different than the NSF Research Traineeship Program in the sense that this one is the one that's going to allow us to know what's working and generate the evidence for it. So the NRT programs are setting up these large models at institution for graduate training, and they're collecting a lot of data so we know we're going to get information back. The Innovations in Graduate Education Program is looking at specific interventions and saying, does this work, does this help? So this is really to pilot or test something um, it's much more educational research in that sense because you need to generate the knowledge that you can share across the community for graduate education and I'm going to share one example of a project here with you so you get a sense of what these look like this is a project from Florida State University and what they're doing is testing out a mixed reality um, platform to see if it can help students become better teachers um, it also can be used as a general communication tool. So what happens is the instructor has motion detectors and also microphones. The grad students are going to love this part. Those students sitting in the room, the avatars, those are actually grad students. So you get to log into the program as an avatar. And the instructor is teaching. And I can tell you from watching demonstrations of this, if the instructor isn't very well, the behavior of the students in the classroom disintegrates over time. And then the instructor is trying to handle this. The, I think the real beauty of this is it allows you to play out scenarios that you might not encounter otherwise in a classroom or you might not encounter until you're in your first teaching environment. And that's not always the best place. Um, we all know that you can have some very difficult situations in a classroom that we would never generate in a classroom because you would only deal with it when it happens, but this allows you to test that out and see how you respond to it. It also lets you see how you're interacting with, other, with the students in your classroom as you're teaching. So, so this right now, they've, they've been testing this out on chemistry TAs, and so we're looking forward to seeing their results. I did have one suggestion for them after I sat through the first 20 minute demonstration. I suggested that they get those little things you can throw on Mario Kart because it really was like a long demo. So, <laughs> but it, I think it's going to be a really good learning tool. Oops. So with that, I'm going to draw this to a conclusion. I just want to encourage you, if you have any interest in either the NRT program or the IGE program, please look up those solicitations online. Um, the best thing to do if you have questions afterwards, you're always welcome to email me. But I see some of our current PIs in the room, and, and they will all tell you it's much more efficient to email to nrt at nsf.gov or ige at nsf.gov, because that goes to our entire team. And so if you do have any questions about that, please feel free to, to let us know. And I think we've got, we're opening up for questions now. OK. So, yeah, Good morning, everyone. Um, we were wondering in table one, um, what percentage of the NSF, um, of those 43 students, 43,000 students you were talking about, actually are actively doing the integrative interdisciplinary work? And so we were curious about that. Um, I'd also be really curious about that. <laughs> I, I don't think that we have that kind of data available to us even, because the thing is, I mean, the IGERTs overall, I mean, there you're talking about several thousand students, but I, I don't want to say that people that weren't in IGERTs may not be doing that. I mean, they might be. I just don't think that we have that type of data available. What we're hoping is that over time, one of the, one of the big um, pushes behind the NRT program is that whatever happens becomes sustainable at institutions. And so what we're hoping is that that $3 million we give people becomes a catalyst. And so that eventually everybody is getting those types of experiences. One of the things that came out of that recent report was a recommendation that funding agencies use their leverage to, I'm looking for the right verb. Um, incentivize, incentivize um, institutions to have this broader training umbrella in place. And so 
we, because the report just came out, we're now having those internal discussions within the foundation to think about what our response will be to this and the best way to move forward from that. Because it's been suggested all the, from outside entities all the way from if you get a research assistantship, the institution must have broader training in place to, you know, what about making sure everybody's at least doing a professional development plan. So, I mean, there, I think there's kind of a spectrum in there. But thank you. That's, it's a wonderful question. Someday we'll have all that data. <laughs> so. Hi. We talked primarily about uh, the sort of idea of integrating across education phases, so starting with primary and secondary, and how the different programs are either are or are not integrating and talking to each other, especially in the context of how primary and secondary education and STEM is working and sort of rote memorization as opposed to inquiry based and creativity and how these ideas of creativity that are so prevalent here could be or should be integrated earlier on. So that, that's a very interesting question and I'm going to share with you just some of my personal experience on that side and kind of how it's informed my thinking. I think depending upon where you are, the, the background and the capacity of teachers at, at the primary and secondary levels sometimes don't always allow for this type of inquiry and integrative thinking, um, simply because if they didn't have that in their training, they don't always get it later to allow them to get that level of support. Um, within the foundation, we did have a program at one point that allowed us to sort of reach across, and I know some of our programs are still doing that by sending graduate students out into the K-12 community. And what I saw personally by doing that was it allowed that type of support for, stu for teachers, for in-service teachers, to bring that type of learning into the K-12 classrooms. Um, the teachers told us on average it took them two years to feel confident enough that they could lead that type of um, teaching in their own classrooms without that level of support in the background. But I mean, I, with the next generation science standards, I mean, that's where everything is moving. And so it, I think really a lot of that is gonna come down to the, the support that the teachers get, because I don't think it's for a lack of wanting to do it. things uh, timely maybe the <laughs> the table on deck could come up and stand next to the <laughs> current table um, so this question was sparked I think by the the interpretation of the climate data with with sound and music um, how does NSF enable or does it not enable actually to partner with colleges of art and design to be able to actually make those types of um, interdisciplinary relations either getting graduate students from those departments or even partnering with faculty from those departments so we, we support STEM, and, and that's where our funding goes for our graduate students. Having said that, though, I think it's important you know, to reach out to a broader umbrella when you're thinking about how you're communicating. And so, yes, we pull that in, those pieces in. I think as people are doing communications, we're seeing more and more of that. Um, a lot of the communications workshops I've seen are very, very creative. They're doing a lot of improv. They're, you know, they're working with different groups to see how do you work in front of green screens, how do you respond to reporters' questions, all of those types of things. And so I think in that sense, you can get that broader umbrella. In terms of the funding piece, though, within the Division of Graduate Education, the grad students that we are supporting are, are within um, STEM disciplines. So for us, we were discussing the idea of breadth and depth and how difficult it was to deal with that sometimes. And for me, the, the biggest example is I'm a biologist and I'm listening to one of these modeling talks and they throw a formula slide and, and I'm, I'm done. And so how do, you, how do you deal with that issue starting from the undergraduate all the way to the PhD? 
Okay, so if I understand the question, and I may need you to stay here, I want to make sure I get this right. So you're asking me to solve how, how do you, you well, communicate across ideas. disciplines? Is yeah, <laughs> I think we speak two languages when you move from, the, from the, some of the languages as biology and, and perhaps even art to, mm -hmm. to languages that use essentially a, a different uh, vocabulary, the, the right. mathematical vocabulary. Right. No, and I think that's a, uh, that's a really good point. And we see that a lot in programs that struggle with this. Sometimes that's one of the first things they do in boot camps is how do you get together and what is the language that we all use so that we can communicate with each other. And I think that's one of the critical pieces to do any kind of interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work. You all have to be able to speak to each other. And and I, I don't know as though there's an easy shortcut to that. I, from what I've seen is people, you simply get together and you start talking about how would you describe problems, what is the language you use. Everybody needs enough of a foundation to be able to understand each other. And then beyond that, I don't know as though everything has to be at the same level because as once you have that sensitivity and you know that you need to speak to someone in a little bit different way, you can start to share ideas across in that sense. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, that's something I would, I would love to hear from this group what approaches people are taking, but that's what I've seen, honestly, is a lot of the, um, the, the boot camps and these interdisciplinary teams, they're getting support as they go through to bridge those divides and really be consciously thinking about it. You need to be at the mic, Glenda. Yeah. yeah. Just at the. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> the, the people streaming appreciate it. Yeah. So one of the things that one of the things we did in our NRT training program to bridge the language, we're on, we have a program that's integrating informatics into microbiome research and engineering. And informatics is not an easy topic <laughs> to teach. Hi. Um, so we had students create a blog, and when they would come across a term um, they didn't understand, this was a collective blog, they would try to define it in their best terms. It was a t term from the other discipline, and then the students from that discipline would um, make adjustments online and then we'd have follow-up discussions in class and that was helpful uh, to everyone. Um. Do we skip table five? Well, I think we did. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm going to take the opportunity then because there's overflow there's a table down in overflow which is just before your question here. Um, they had a question down there, which was, can you speak more to specific challenges faced by the IGERT NRT programs and how NSF has addressed them? You've, some of that discussion we've already talked about, but maybe you could think of other. Can I ask you to just, uh, just restate? That. Yeah. Um, can you speak more to specific challenges faced by the IGERT NRT programs uh, and how NSF has addressed them? I get. Yeah. I, I'm not quite sure in terms of specific challenges from uh, yeah I, I think I'll ask them to text me okay. more additional okay. information once you get so. clarification <laughs> we'll come back table five so our question was similar to table ones and I guess what we were asking is do you have ways that you can measure or you can show that the cross-disciplinary Iger type trainings have been more successful than some of the traditional graduate trainings that we've used in the past particularly because you've been doing this for a long time and, and I don't know if it be job placement or publications that are more uh, cross-disciplinary, but could you comment on that? So for everybody that's involved in IGERTS, they know we collect a lot of data. <laughs> right, Fred? It's a lot. Um, one of the challenges with that data is that we need to then step back and analyze it. So I've been at the foundation now for a little over two years, and so when I came in, we work as as Igert is getting ready to sunset. We've still got about 60 active programs. One of the things that we're looking at doing is exactly what you're asking: stepping back and taking a look at that data, because I, those are some of the things that I personally would like to know and see if if there are lessons learned along those lines coming out of that data. With the NRTs, I'll tell you, we're we're so early in the game that I can't really speak to that yet. We're hoping 
hoping that eventually, though, by pulling that data and probably combining it with some of the national placement data of where people are going, that we might be able to start to get a sense of, you know, are there differences, you know, between people that are in different places. Part of the issue gets to be, though, one of the things we talked about before is, you know, what, what, what would be the control for that, right? You know, so so who would we identify that we'd say, well, you're doing a great job at not being interdisciplinary at all, and we're going to use you as our control group. So, and I think just because of the way fields morph and things move over time, it might be a little bit hard to get that control per se. You might think about universities in other countries that don't have an interdisciplinary type of program. Yeah, that might be a problem. You just use a total. Oh, oh, of everybody. That's a good idea. So you're coming back, Glenda. <laughs> so, Laura, as I was listening to you talk about internships, um, I was wondering how people are able to fit internships in in a one-year NRT, and I was wondering if it's a function of two NRTs, and I guess this is two questions. Also, the diversity of courses, the number of courses people are actually creating, is there a big range in diversity of courses for the NRT, and is it a function of one versus two-year NRT programs? Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Glenda. So I think if I understand the question right, you're asking about um, how are people fitting in internships because they're going out and doing these. and. Yes within a one or two year time span, yes. and then also the numbers of courses that are yes. being created. Okay, so just one, one thing that I wanna clarify about the NRTs is that the funding from the NRT is not linked to you being a trainee in the program. So as a project sets up their NRT program, they may have a large number of students that never receive any funding from the program in terms of like a uh, fellowship. But we consider everybody that's in the program to be a trainee for the entire time that they're in their degree granting program. So all of them would be trainees for their four or five, hopefully not six or seven years, that it takes them to finish. And so during that time frame, about 20% right now in any given year of those trainees are involved in an internship somewhere. Those students um, work it in in different ways, and most of the time it's because this is what they see as being critical for their career progression. Um, they, these internships will range from three to six months usually, depending upon what they're looking to do. And it varies in terms of the way the programs have these set up. Some do this earlier on, some do it later. It just depends on what works out best for the students. One of the things with the NRTs that we've started doing now um, in the newer solicitation and we'll grandfather people in is that if the student gets an internship and they can get paid doing the internship, at least at the level we pay them, then they can extend their time. If Let's say that that project was only going to give them 12 months. They can take a break, do the internship, and then come back and get the rest of their funding. Um, and so those internships are being worked in in different ways. They're made available to all of the trainees, whether or not they're being funded through the program. And, and we wanted to make sure that those important opportunities were available to everyone. Now, in terms of the coursework, that varies dramatically. We have some projects come in that are essentially writing completely new curriculum because they're putting in place a new degree program. You know, that's at one extreme. At the other end, we might have projects that are putting in place a couple of additional classes that, that are truly integrative in nature. And so we, we sort of see that spectrum. It's OK. So from <laughs> you're just going to yell it's, from down It's there. a hard knock life. That's right. So from, from uh, table seven, for could you talk a little bit more about what makes the innovation and graduate education program unique in the testing sense, as opposed to I know for all of our IGERT NSFs, we had evaluations and things like that. So what is it that makes it a testing program as opposed to a program that is being evaluated? So I think a lot of times within the foundation, there's confusion in terms of evaluation and, 
and assessment in terms of what we're thinking about. So with all of the NRT and iGroup projects, you have to do programmatic evaluation. That's going to include assessment of some of your key objectives. So not just like we had this many students, we did this, we did that, you know, we, we developed these courses with this many students attended, but you're also looking at some competencies in there. So we require everybody to look at communication competencies. And so they may also have additional objectives that are really important where they're going to be doing assessment on. We will get some information out of, the, out of these um, NRT projects in that way, and we've gotten some from IGERT. This will answer some select questions, not all the way across all of the projects, but it will answer some select questions in terms of whether or not in their environment they're being successful. In contrast, the IGE projects are looking at an approach and generating enough information that they can share it out in the literature. So if any of you are familiar with um, the literature on undergraduate education and what works and what doesn't, it's a very robust literature um, doing education research. We envision the IGE being comparable to that. So if you come in to do an Innovations in Graduate Education project, most of these teams have someone from their College of Education on there. You need to embed what you're doing within the current literature so that we understand the framework for what you're trying to test. Then you need to clearly lay out your objectives and have assessment tools in place to answer each of those. So that when you're done, we know did this particular intervention work so that it can be shared in the literature and become part of the best practices. In a more diffuse way, we're hoping we're going to be able to do some of that with the NRT and the IGERT data, but it's more diffuse. It's not going to be as, um, as focused in terms of a test bed project. Hi. <coughs> Our table was also um, talking a lot about the internships, and I'm wondering if there are some creative ways that programs are bridging the off-campus experience and the on-campus experience. I think one of the most productive ways that they're kind of bridging that off-campus, on-campus, is by setting up collaborative teams that involve people from the industry or um, government labs. And so it becomes an internship in the sense that the students go to the other location and see what it's like to work in a government lab or see what it's like to work within um, private industry, but they're long-term sustained partnerships. And I think in many ways for the students that becomes extremely beneficial, but I think it's also really beneficial for the faculty. You know, I mean, sometimes faculty, I think that's where you get some pushback sometimes. Well, what do you mean my students are going to go someplace for three months? Well, if that's part of your core research mission, I, th I think that that is probably an easier way to integrate in. Um, so uh, table nine, our question was kind of, um, if you could talk about the motivation to move from IGERT to NRT, and what are the improvements that you see that motivated that change in programs? Sure. So when we, when we made that transition from IGERT to NRT, what we really did was take a look back and say, well, what were some of the lessons learned from the IGERTs, and, and how could we improve as we move forward? And so I know sometimes when you look at it, everyone's like, well, it's just an IGERT, you just changed the name. And it, some of the things though that we learned from the IGERTs and, and that we wanted to apply broadly. So the things that I'm going to say, it's not that they don't apply to some of the IGERTs, but I think we took these things and put them front and center for the NRT so that they applied to all of the NRTs. One of the things that we wanted to make sure is that this funding was used as a catalyst. So the intent was that we truly start to see institutional change. And because of that, you're not even allowed to put in an NRT if you don't have a strong letter of support from your institution saying that what you want to do aligns with the mission of your institution. Because the intent here is that $3 million, yeah, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's really a catalyst at an institutional level. And so we want that to build up that infrastructure that once that money is gone, it will continue to support the, the institution post-NSF funding. So that was one thing. We really wanted that catalyst at the institutional level and the sustainability. The other thing was the idea of support for 
for the fellows in the program or the trainees. Um, most of the IGERT projects supported students from beginning to end, so the entire time that they were in the project. And that was a huge benefit to the students that were able to be in those projects. And, you know, and I, I'm sure, you know, it's like they gained a, just immense amounts of um, professional development, and it, it gives you a good sense of security knowing you're being funded throughout your time in graduate school. The issue was the impact size, though. And so what we did when we moved over to NRT, we wanted to make it clear that we didn't anticipate students to be funded for the whole time. Most of these students are funded for one year, sometimes two years. But as I said before, when I was talking about some of the projects, on average, 50% of the trainees in our program never get any kind of fellowship funds from the programs. So they're just in there because they want all of the other stuff. And so our philosophy was if you build it and it's good, students will want to come. You know, it shouldn't be that they're coming just for that funding. Because is that a sustainable model? Especially at institutions where the, the fellowships that we're giving are significantly higher than what the institution normally gives. So again, it's part of this whole sustainability model. And by doing that and decoupling that the fellowship funding from the trainee model, we're able to include a lot more students. So normally each of the NRT projects will have on average 60 students. Some of them go up to 120. So there's there's quite a spectrum in there, but there's a lot of students that are that are benefiting as trainees over the life of these projects. So I would say that those are the two biggest takeaways that we had that we really changed when we moved forward.